Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the sixth in our series on ushering in the ecological revolution of our Naturenomics Dialogue series, which has been on for a week. In some of our previous sessions till now, we've explored the need for integrating communities and ecology with economic planning for a Naturenomics based recovery plan, tapping the inherent resiliency and stability of rural and local economies for generating green jobs. Uh, which are becoming more important now than ever. The urgent need for providing ownership and management rights of our forests to our communities, especially women. Today, we're going to be taking off from that session and really take a look at how we define and measure growth and prosperity in this new age and this turning point that we're all in. Most measures till now have failed to integrate environmental components, but uh, COVID-19's intersection with deforestation, wildlife, ecological health has really highlighted how intimate all of these connections actually are and how urgently we need to redesign our concept of well-being and our concept of growth. Our esteemed panelists for this evening, uh, Dr. Khosla, Sarah Khaling, Saurav Roy, and Shankar Venkateshwaran will share their thoughts on how we can do this. I thank all the attendees for joining and showing your interest for this session. We'll be accepting a total of about five questions for the panelists, and we request you to put all your questions in the Q&A box that you see down under your screen on Zoom. If you're one of the 23,000 people that this is streaming to through Facebook, please drop questions in the comments section. Uh, today's panel will be moderated by Dr. Ashok Khosla. Dr. Khosla has been chairman of the Development Alternative Group since 1982. DA is the world's first social enterprise dedicated to sustainable development. Through DA and its commercial affiliate Tara, they create sustainable, scalable consumption and production solutions in rural India. Dr. Khosla has served as director of the Indian government's first environment office, director of InfoTerra in UNEP, co-chair of the UN's International Resource Panel, president of the International Union for Conservation of Nature, and also president of the Club of Rome. He also served as a member of India's Scientific Advisory Council to the Cabinet and has received multiple accolades from the British government, the UAE, and the UN, and has held various faculty positions at Harvard. For now, over to you, Dr. Khosla, to take this Thank you, forward. Sora. Thank That's you so much. Uh, very nice of you. Uh, I hope uh, that uh, some of the pe people are already online, and uh, I would like to start by introducing you to the three co panelists that we have here. Um, the first is Sarla Kaling. She's the regional director of Atri's regional office for the Eastern Himalaya, Northeast India uh, region. Her main work is on managing product projects, research, design, analysis, fundraising, networking. In other words, she's the boss and she has to bring everything in and make sure it goes out. She has more than 15 years of experience of working in the field of ecology, especially their relationship with people and biodiversity in the Himalayas. Before she joined ATRI, she worked with WWF and for the Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund, fund uh, in the Eastern Himalayan Biodiversity Hotspot Program. We also have uh, my old friend Shankar, Shankar Venkateshan, who is a part of the founding team of EQ, Investment Advisors, that is setting up a fund to invest in publicly listed companies to make sure that they behave properly, especially on sustainability and ESG issues. Uh, he was chief of Tata Sustainability Group at Tata Sons Limited, we guided the whole group on sustainability and corporate responsibility initiatives. He worked in Price Waterhouse Coopers before that as director of sustainability. And before that, he has 15 years in social development work with various international NGOs, including ActionAid and the American India Foundation. He has helped draft the national guidelines for responsible business conduct. And they've been released about a year ago and he's now assisting the government in trying to make sure they get implemented properly. Saurav Roy leads the corporate social responsibility efforts of Tata Steel, which spans sustainability and corporate finance and merger and acquisitions across a range of se sectors like metals and mining, power, logistics, infrastructure, 
and hospitality. In his last engagement, Saurabh anchored the sustainability strategy work of Tata Sustainability Group, TSG, and worked with Tata companies to integrate social and environmental aspects in their approaches to business. He's also worked with the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh and several other organizations in the Indian development sector before he joined the Tata Group. And he has a deep interest in both um, sustainability and development finance. So we have these three people and I am supposed to uh, make sure that we have a good conversation over the next hour uh, on the issues that have been identified for this session, which are broadly speaking uh, interdependence of various kinds, which I will try and give you a little bit of a glimpse into, and the relationship between sustainability and cultural, cultural issues, the value systems that we have from various kinds of cultures with the specific purpose of looking at whether indigenous cultures on the one hand and business cultures on the other have anything to offer uh, in terms of more sustainable practices. Uh, I myself believe that most cultures, indigenous or, or reasonably pre-more modern, except maybe for the last three or 400 years, um, have in them the value systems of being a one world, uh, a one, uh, one entity uh, of uh, life on this planet. In, um, in ancient uh, Vedic times, we used to call it Vasudeva Katambakam. But you know, all the way, I've never been in a culture, including in East Africa, in South Africa, they have terms like Ubuntu in Bantu in South Africa. They have terms like Umoja in Swahili. Uh, they have terms almost in every native uh, American Indian language. Uh, that basically says the same thing, that we are all one and uh, we are uh, not just a cooperative uh, species, but we are much more than that, a uh, mutually supportive species. So this goes back very deeply into human culture. Uh, I think since the Industrial Revolution, maybe a little bit before that, and I suppose the seeds of it were, uh, if you'll pardon the pun, sown in the Agricultural Revolution, um, that we sort of became a little bit alienated from the land and from each other. In uh, ecological science, we have a number of insights uh, on this interdependence. There is, of course, the well-known interdependence between the five kingdoms of nature. The waste of one kingdom is always becomes the food of another kingdom. Otherwise, you would be buried in waste. Nature has no waste because of the intricate mechanisms it's designed through the five kingdoms to uh, take care of what we now call the circular economy. Uh, there is also, of course, the kinds of interdependence between species that we call uh, mutualism. For example, um, a bird feeding off an alligator's teeth or commensalism, uh, for example, orchids living on a tree or even parasitism uh, like mosquitoes and uh, human beings. Uh, these, are, these are different kinds of uh, relationships and, and um, uh, relationships which often are positive, but not, not necessarily always. In social systems, uh, it seems to me that we really now have to look at uh, the kinds of interdependence in different economic strata, uh, in different social uh, segments, uh, between governments and communities. So there's going to be quite a lot of work for us in the next 50 minutes. And I'm now going to stop talking and suggest that one of the panelists take up a question that I'm going to ask them and then the others see whether they can uh, do a little bit better. Uh, I was going to, the first question I think I would like to ask them is, how can ecological indicators how can ecological indicators be better integrated with social development and GDP 
measures to create a more holistic understanding of, uh, uh, of well-being, human well-being and natural uh, resilience and, and productivity. Uh, can any of you, one of you, choose to give us your views on that? Would uh, Shankar, would you like to try your hand at that? Yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, Ashok. I can give it a shot. Uh, I think, uh, you know, what is certainly uh, problematic as an indicator is GDP. And sadly, that's the most universal one. Uh, because uh, GDP certainly uh, doesn't seem to measure, and I think Robert Kennedy, way back in, in the 60s, uh, I think it was in the University of Kansas, made a very interesting speech on what it doesn't measure and what it seems to measure, which are almost perverse. And I think he ended by saying that it seems to measure everything, in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. I think that, that was the, the, his quote. Very much and I think so profound, Ashok, so long ago, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think we are struggling with that. And we are struggling even uh, in this country uh, with that, uh, you know, with looking at GDP as a measure. Uh, you know, five trillion economy gets thrown around just every now and then. And I think what does uh, what that does create is that it seems to create a sort of uh, when when you when you're running after a measure like that, it seems to not take into consideration what the costs are of reaching that that particular measure. Right. And and so that's I think the big uh, uh, challenge. I, I, GDP does have something which, which is very attractive, which is why it is used so widely. I mean, you know, it is relatable, it is comparable. Uh, you know, so these are all important fact, you know, elements of an indicator. You can compare it across countries, across time, across geographies, across different uh, such dimensions. Uh, but sadly, it doesn't uh, measure what we wanted to measure. Now, attempts, of course, have been made to try and broaden the idea of measuring uh, development. So we have we've had the Human Development Index, for, for, for example, for a long time. Uh, which is looks at life expectancy, education, living standards. And we've also, that's evolved into something called the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index. But what happens with all these indices is a lot of them are still focusing on the social dimension or the human dimension, which is, I think, very important, which GDP certainly doesn't. But I don't know whether there's enough work and thinking being done which incorporates the, the natural dimension, the nature's uh, dimension into, into measuring uh, development. And to me, that's the big challenge that we're all uh, faced with. So I'll stop there because I really don't know what the answer is, but clearly that is the gap uh, that we need to seek. And I certainly would like to hear from uh, both Sarla and you uh, about how that gap gets, gets filled in, or what are, the, what are the kinds of indicators that we are sort of thinking about. Thank you. Saurav, would you like to uh, add something to that? Is Saurav on the line? I think he was there briefly, but I don't see you're, him there. Uh, Saurav, you're on mute. Can we unmute Saurav? Okay, so let me start with Sarla and then we come back to Saurav. Sarla, Sar Sar do you have some uh, uh, insights that you'd like to share with us? Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure being on this uh, webinar. And I think uh, I'm also very happy because this is a culmination of some discussions that we've been having with uh, Balipara Foundation as part of the uh, you know, Eastern Himalaya uh, coalition that we are trying to come up with. And one of the things that we've always been discussing is you know, how do we bring ecological indicators and environmental indicators in the mainstream of measuring growth. And I think uh, it's again like my previous speaker, Shankar has already said, this is a challenge and we do not have the answers to this. But what I can say is there, are, there has been so much of work on the ecological sides that could be, you know, there are so many frameworks that are already existing. You, when, if you look at the ecosystem services framework, which really links very well into, you know, uh, helping us to develop this indicators, there, there is this uh, socio-ecological socio landscape 
ecosystem-based management uh, approaches. There are several approaches, there are several framework, and there's so much of scientific work already done there. There's so much of knowledge, there's so much, but I don't understand why we have not been able to, you know, mainstream ecological and environmental indicators into any of these growth indicators. Well, it's so obvious for us, and I think these have been discussed and these have been uh, issues of discourses. I just don't understand why we have not been able to, you know, put it into this, uh, put it into the overall growth indicator. So to me, actually, you know, when I, when you ask this question, it's, I'm a little bewildered because I think it's so, for us as natural scientists, we think it's there. It's so obvious. There's the connectivity, the linkages, and COVID-19 even makes it even more clear to us that in the ways ahead, we have to have, but I don't know why, you know, it's been such a big challenge for us to do that. You're quite right, sir. Now, let me, since we don't have Saurav yet, maybe I can just say a couple of words on both of you. Uh, we've done a huge amount of work on trying to quantify, as you say, uh, the ecosystem services, biodiversity related uh, indicators, which can either be measured just as well as any, a lot of parameters in GDP, maybe better. Uh, and in the case of uh, TEEB, the, the yes. big study that was carried out by UNEP and IUCN and others, uh, TEEB has shown that it's eminently possible to amplify the GDP indicators with, or, 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 or complement them with much better uh, insight into the costs. The costs especially because uh, normally, uh, we, we uh, assume that the costs to nature are zero. But I, I would like to also to say to Shankar that actually the more interesting things are the benefits, the benefits that you, for, you, you ignored uh, in counting your GDP. There are many things, of course, uh, economic parameters for 70 years since Kuznets invented the term GDP have been worked over so everybody knows how to do that. But this, a lot of the social benefits and certainly many of the natural environmental sort of capital, natural capital benefits are forgotten. So both from the point of view of costs and from the point of view of unquantified or unregistered, uh, re unrecognized um, benefits, uh, the GDP parameter really is a misleading parameter. Uh, you can't throw it away because most of the, the world is run on it. And indeed, you shouldn't throw it away because the, the economic ones do matter. It's not that they are, they are completely useless, but they are not very good at designing future investments and decisions uh, without the other ones. So, Sarla, the only answer I can give you is that the world is run by economists and economists don't see anything but money. There's just no way they can recognize that there is anything other than dollars. And it's usually just dollars, you know? So uh, I don't know what but, else can one say. Yeah. Mm. But I also think, you know, some of the uh, benefits of nature, like, you know, there are so many of these intangible benefits that we talk about, like spiritual or aesthetic or just this, you know, what? which people are talking about even now, even more now in the COVID situation about, you know, how nature gives you de-stresses you, gives you that mental, you know, peace and all that. I think it's some of these things are so intangible. Of course. Right. Yes. And I think it's so difficult to measure these kind of, you know, how do you represent them? How do you, you know, even measure them? Some of these are also a challenge, I guess. Uh, they're a challenge, but then there are lots of things we make assumptions about in the economy, which are all, would have been a challenge if you were as rigorous as, as you know, they expect you to be. Uh, let me come back to you, Sarla, about what your insights, having worked in the Northeast and in the Eastern Himalayas uh, with many tribal uh, populations, people, um, what are the indigenous perspectives uh, on the issues between uh, economic, ecological, and human uh, interactions of this type? Yeah. Do, they, do they have answers that we could feed into the system for designing a better parameter? Uh, I think uh, the uh, for the uh, tribal or the indigenous com communities, a lot of, you know, the cultural aspects of nature, the spiritual aspects of nature, and also the 
social institutions and traditions that they form and they're able to carry on with. I think that matters a lot to them. They value that a lot, their own you know, indigenous value systems, their traditions. Uh, and also, uh, if you look at them, I think they also live in a landscape which is a social ecological landscape because you're not far away from nature. So, you know, relationship is there. But again, I must again say that again, in the world that we are in and the changes that are happening, we cannot again romanticize these, you know, things because things are really changing fast, for example. Uh, so even in the Northeast, uh, even in areas uh, where uh, there were pristine habitats and all that, so a lot of, uh, I sh should I say, developmental projects are there. There's so much of infrastructure development. And there's the huge issue of aspirations of the people, the younger generations. So uh, I don't know, you know, in a way, you know, there are those value systems which used to be there, but it's again a very big question. Are they, you know, are they eroding? Are they changing? Again, culture is something which is so dynamic. But I guess there are some systems, there are certain things we can still take from them because uh, there is still that closeness with nature. But at the same time, I have to say it's changing a lot because you know, the economic, because of economic development and the aspiration to be, you know, grow and be rich and earn money, you know, so, you know, so as to put it in simple words. So that again, you know, it causes a little bit of, you know, uh, erosion in some of the value systems that we can see and, uh, I mean, for all of us to see and read and we've also heard a lot about uh, what's going on in the Northeast in terms of the nature, what is happening to nature or the environment and all that, so. Yeah, well, this is a major problem. You know, the, with all its shortcomings, and God knows there are shortcomings, the American way of life is, is seductive. I mean, you, you watch it on television, and uh, every young person wants a bit of it. Why not me too? Yeah. And, and you see that even in a place like Bhutan, which has really got its, you know, its society so well-centered, and its value system so well-centered. But when young people with, are going to be bombarded with... Um, the kinds of goodies that uh, other people have in the world, um, they're seductive. You, you lose track very quickly. So uh, this, uh, Ashok, yeah. Ashok, just a couple of, uh, if I may, just a couple of experiences on this, if I may share. I'm not no expert on this, but just to, I was just struck, in fact, that uh, a couple of months ago, in fact, Saurabh Roy is not here, but, we, you know, Tata Steel does a annual uh, sort of a gathering of indigenous communities uh, every year for about two, three days. And I had gone there and I was to speak to some of them on climate change. And I have to say, I was so struck by the fact that I have so little to tell them because they can tell us so much more about climate change than we could ever tell them. Uh, you know, uh, all the stuff that we keep talking amongst ourselves about preserving forests. Uh, we have one of our NDCs is about creating uh, carbon sinks through uh, forestation. Uh, indigenous communities are doing that uh, and they get no rewards for that at, actually. Uh, and whereas, so in, in many ways, uh, their pains are subsidizing our luxuries. Exactly. Uh, so, so I think that somewhere, you know, uh, we need to find a way to enable them to uh, also live what you're, what you're saying, the seductive American way of maybe some incomes, but by doing things what they normally do, which is conserving, which is using, uh, you know, uh, in, a, in a frugal way uh, and all that, because that adds to what our own national commitments uh, definitely are. So I'm wondering how's, how, how does one make this happen so that uh, what they do uh, is something that ben which benefits all of us, they get rewarded. And that's something that's always a very striking thing for me. You're absolutely right. Of course, you know, there's a lot of talk about carbon offsets, about biodiversity offsets and ways to reward people, but it hasn't ever taken off. And the chances are it'll get hijacked long before it hits the ground. Somebody will have captured it and that would be the end of it. But Shankar, no. since Saurav is not on, online, uh, maybe you can help with a little bit of your background with business. How can business help bring about, or at least not upset, the current uh, types of, of range of 
of uh, good value systems that you both have just described. So the question is, in our desperate need to incre increase GDP, uh, in, in order to uh, increase consumerism and, and, and production of, of goods that are either non-essential or whatever, uh, business is locked in to some extent in promoting the kind of value systems that we now find are inimical to the future of the planet and of our communities. So what are we going to do with that? How is business going to play a good citizen role? Uh, I think that's a, that's an in, important sort of consideration because uh, you know uh, states can't do it by themselves. People need to get involved, and of course, business uh, needs to get involved. And I think it's all it, it, in some senses goes back to the so social contract that business has with society of producing goods and services, but at what cost? And and clearly, regulations are supposed to play that role, but uh, you know sometimes. They don't, and especially as businesses become bigger and bigger and more powerful, uh, they have a greater influences, influence on regulation to, to their own benefit. So that happens to be the million dollar question. But I think the good news is that things are changing. Uh, and I think, uh, and let me just, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, tell you the way I'm seeing these changes. So one is that I think the set of drivers uh, that, that actually push uh, business behavior uh, are actually increasingly widening. Uh, traditionally, there were three drivers that business used to take very seriously. One is, of course, regulations, because you have to you know, follow the law. Uh, the second is signals that you would get from investors. Uh, it, the people who, uh, who have invested in your business or, or who are providing you loans to buy equipments uh, that you require for your business. Uh, so, Obviously, they are taken very seriously. And third, of course, is customers. These were the traditional uh, stakeholders that businesses would take very seriously. Now, fortunately, the good news is that all these three are changing in terms of their expectations of business. Regulations are getting tighter and stronger, partly because of uh, you know, all our inter international commitments that we are signing on to, like, like the SDGs, like the Paris Agreement, which is then obviously forcing regulations to make those things happen. Uh, investors, uh, and this is very interesting, and I, since I sort of work with a, with a startup that's looking at investments as a way to make this happen, investors are actually recognizing that, that their investments, and, and, and this is you know, very interesting because I, I remember one, one uh, a very a veteran investor once telling me that there are two emotions that guide an investor. Uh, one is uh, greed and the other is fear. Uh, and fear really plays a big role in this because I think what happens is investors are beginning to realize that companies that do not, that do not uh, society or the environment and the environment uh, are actually at risk. And so their own investments are at risk. So more and more investors are actually pushing companies into more responsible behavior. Uh, and just to give you a sense, uh, estimates are anywhere from 20 to $25 trillion in, in investments, that is uh, of investor money, goes into companies that actually are operating responsibly. So investors are pushing this agenda not out of any goodness of heart necessarily, but just out of the sphere and greed of emotions. Self-interest, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And of course, third customers uh, are also behaving differently, not so much in this country, Ashok. Yeah. And I think to me, that's the big challenge uh, uh, that, you know, how do we as customers make those choices uh, of, of what, comp what products to buy, what comp I personally, for example, haven't touched uh, a cola, an aerated drink for the last 15 years, uh, because I found, I believe that they unsustainably use water. But I wish there were, just imagine if, if all of us started behaving that way, uh, you know, these kinds of changes would happen. Uh, so I think the drivers are, are there, the stakeholders are getting more and more, uh, 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 the same stakeholders are asking different questions. New stakeholders like communities and employees are asking, are becoming uh, more vocal. And that's pushing companies into behaving in a slightly different way. So for example, triple bottom line thinking, 
So thinking not just of your financial bottom line, but also how are you impacting society and the environment. Uh, looking at SDGs and, and making that a part of your core business uh, framework. Uh, UN principles, guiding principles for business and human rights. Something that our own uh, country has, the National Guidelines for Responsible Business Conduct. Now, all these are frameworks that are getting created and companies are therefore getting more and more urged into behaving in a, in a responsible manner. So I think, I, think the, I think the stakeholders are closing in and there are responses from the system that are helping companies to start getting more and more uh, responsible about this. And I, I would say that it is, it is sort of widespread, but I think the trend is very clear. And what is also interesting, and this ties into the last uh, question that you asked, uh, uh, and I'll stop there after that, is there are also methodologies that are being created, how to measure, uh, the, uh, how to value uh, a business's impact on nature and on the society. So you have something called the natural capital protocol, for example, that which is which in a sense is based on the team framework that you you mentioned earlier. Uh, but this is a this is a a, a global movement of companies, uh, a, academia, uh, NGOs who who come together and created a protocol that helps co companies put a value to their ben costs and benefits of how they impact uh, uh, the. the system or the natural systems. And the, so the dream is, as you start putting a value, uh, a rupee value or a dollar value, as you said earlier, to this, then your, your profit and loss account doesn't just become a financial profit and loss account, it becomes a total uh, profit and loss account. And I think that's the sort of holy grail uh, that we need to move to. So we are moving there, moving very slowly, but I think the movement is, is certainly visible. So I'll stop there. Yes, I think uh, X number of years down the road, 10, 15, 20, uh, things will be a lot better. But there is one flaw, one barrier to change, which is the present construction of professional management, which is not in its interest. That is the major factor preventing real change. Because the investor has a long-term view. The money is tied up. They're going to be looking at not just the next quarter, not just next financial year, but you know, for some time. Uh, the workers, the, the, the partners, the vendors, all have a certain amount of stake in it. But the driver of, of uh, decisions, day-to-day -day decisions, is driven by the next quarter uh, and, and the earnings reports that are going to come up and by the share price of his company, etc. Now, all of that tends to force them, not force them, but enable them to take uh, short-term decisions, which are inimical to, to what you're saying. So we've got maybe to do a little bit of reconfiguring the corporate structure in such a way that these outrageous bonuses that you get either in the banks or in, in manufacturing companies or in, in the energy companies, a huge bonuses for... Uh, immediate sudden uh, you know, windfall gains, uh, that is a driving force that's pretty hard to beat. And so a lot of our problems have arisen because of that uh, part of it. Now, if that were to be taken care of, I think a lot of what you're saying could happen much faster. Sarlai, do you have much to do with businesses uh, as well? Can you the only uh, comment that I had, and that made a lot of sense with what uh, Shankar was saying, is especially in the Himalayas, we, are, we deal with the tourism sector and tourism, which is so much, uh, you know, dependent on uh, nature or the aesthetic value of nature or the cultural value of nature. But tourism itself sometimes has become a bane for the mountains. You know, the kind of tourism the, uh, we have promoted, the growth that we have promoted in tourism basically is, you know, it's very detrimental to nature. And it's, uh, I mean, a lot of, you know, like, I mean, for uh, states like Sikkim or Darjeeling or even Arunachal Pradesh for that matter, and the Northeast where tourism is not so much, uh, I mean, it's not there. Uh, they are looking forward to tourism as being one of the pillars of growth. 
So also like Sikkim and Darjeeling, they say that tourism is their pillar of growth. But the kind of demand for tourism that you have over here, the, you know, the customers and their demand of tourism is completely you know, uh, opposite, diametrically opposite to the culture of the place. For example, we're trying to be, we are trying to work on the food systems, but the kind of customers you get to come here, customers from any part of India would like to come here and again, promote a different kind of a food system. And all the business over here caters to that kind of a food system, instead of, you know, uh, demand for the local food system, which is much more sustainable, for that place, which has less carbon footprint, you know, how do we change this kind of, you know, the, uh, you know, the behavior of customers demand. So we are, I mean, we have a small project initiative, which is going on trying to say, how can we, you know, build a customer system or a demand system, which actually focuses on local things, local products, local food, you know, so homestays, Homestays, well, homestays is one of them, but the entire thing like food to culture to everything else, music, so that which you know doesn't prove detrimental to the culture or to the nature of the place. Um, because the mountains being a very big, uh, you know, tourism industry focus, kind of yes, thing. you're right. This is a major issue, and it's in some ways got built in contradictions which are going to have to be dealt with by very imaginative things. You see, Indian domestic tourism is about going seeing places but carrying your culture and your food and your uh, clothing with you i mean you know you don't you don't go to another place to test their food uh, you don't go to another place to learn about how they dress and how, what they sing or, or what they do you go there to observe uh, and and you got to take your cook and your utensils with you so um this is a, a problem that we've been facing because i work a lot on, on ecotourism both in the plains and in the hills and for example, in Bundelkhand, which is a wonderful area with tremendous, um, you know, heritage uh, of all kinds of things, music, food, culture, stories, and everything. Uh, uh, and, and the people who come there cannot possibly be gaining much. They're, they're just away from home, that's all. So um, we've got to figure out what happens. Now, uh, we're getting close to the end. We've got another 10 minutes or so. Um, what I thought it would be very nice is uh, if you were in charge, if you had, um, you were the advisors rather than, than, than the economists who are running our country, uh, if you were able to say, these are the three, four, five things, uh, and I don't want to put a number on them because they could be dozen, uh, silver bullets, if you like, but it's not a one silver bullet, it's a whole bunch of possible interventions uh, that you would like to see that would enable not so much the GDP being measured right, not so much the question of, of uh, this, uh, you know, uh, interdependence being right, but the outcomes, overall outcomes, uh, such that we have a more resilient, more prosperous, more uh, human, human based uh, and, uh, and, and life-based um, future for this country. How would, you, how would you go about doing that? Would you like to try it, uh, Shankar? Or did you just disappear on purpose? No, I'm, 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 <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm having, I'm having a I bandwidth uh, uh, campaign, so I thought I should put my video off so that uh, no, no, I, I don't really get cut off. Uh, yeah, sure. So, so you know, uh, I'm happy to give you the shot, uh, uh, an answer to that question, uh, Ashok. Uh, in fact, you know, that's one of the things I've been doing for the last seven, eight years, uh, working with the Ministry of Corporate Affairs uh, on, on trying to, you know, build frameworks and reporting frameworks for uh, responsible business conduct. So I mentioned the National Guidelines for Responsible Business Conduct. Uh, I had the good fortune to be one of two people who were charged with uh, drafting that, and that was released last year. Uh, we are we're just in the process of creating a reporting framework uh, on this, uh, which has been uh, approved now by the by you know by the government, and it's going to be released. And the top thousand companies are going to be mandated. The top thousand listed companies will be mandated to report not just on the financial, but on the whole lot of non-financial uh, 
you know, parameters uh, which are relating to uh, nature and to society. So I think that's a very good move from the government. It's actually quite, uh, quite uh, forward-looking. In fact, very few governments actually, uh, and certainly none in the emerging economies have actually done this with any, any degree of seriousness. So I think nudging companies to, uh, you know, to sort of understanding what responsible uh, uh, business means and to be more uh, transparent about it is, I think, a very important element because more, more data that is outside in the public domain on what companies are doing, it allows more stakeholders to then analyze those, uh, uh, those performances and, and do something about it. So civil society, uh, you know, uh, consumer movements and so on, can use that data. So I think that's a very important element that, uh, that can, you know, that as policymakers that want to do. The second one, and this is something that, uh, again, we've been, many of us have been pushing the government to do this more systematically, is that the government, I think, uh, is, the, is the single largest procurer of goods and services uh, in this country. Uh, almost 25% of all goods and services are actually bought, purchased by the government. Now, the, the government typically does its purchases on what they call the basis of L1, the, you know, the lowest quotation. What we have been trying to urge uh, government to do is to also factor in responsible business conduct into their purchase decisions. How do you make public procurement? How do you push and, and favor companies that actually exhibit responsible business in government procurements that happen? So that then there's a business reason to, for you to become more responsible in the way you conduct yourself. So, so that is the second uh, sort of prescription uh, that we've been trying to work on. And third, which is actually, it feeds into this, is trying to create an index that actually can measure a company's performance on being responsible. So if you have, if you, if you create an index or if the government creates an index, because, you know, private, any private uh, person or entity creates an index, I, it may not be taken seriously, but if government creates an index using the national guidelines as the basis to create this index, then you can actually uh, put companies in a sort of uh, pecking order. And so that decisions on, you know, whether you should allow a state should allow, which kind of company should a state allow in tourism to Sarla's point could be determined by how that company scores in terms of its responsible business conduct. So it could be things like that. So I think these are the kinds of things that I think, at least for our business, uh, or to make sure that businesses start taking this more seriously and that there is, there is a return for them when they take it seriously uh, is something that I would, uh, I would think are very good steps to take this forward. I think those are terrific, terrific steps. Sarla, would you like to uh, start wrapping up with yours? Well, like yes, uh, Dr. Kosla. So, um, I think, um, so just even going through, you know, I don't know, you know, for these things, whether, you know, we have a best practice kind of model that we can look at. There's Bhutan, but, you know, uh, with these, uh, you, uh, this perception of, you know, you, but is it, you know, how do we come up with indicators? I'm talking from an indicator point of view, but even looking at the GNH uh, kind of an index, can we come up with some, you know, measurable indicators about, you know, that's the closest country that we can probably explore to look at, you know, how are they looking at these as a best, best practice measure. So that is one. The other entry point uh, I see right now, and we've been working in this national, there's a, project, a huge program, the National Biodiversity Mission Program, of which one component that we are working with is the bioeconomy, uh, you know, biodiversity and bioeconomy program. So probably uh, bioeconomy is also one of the entry points that I could think of, you know, which could showcase, demonstrate, because I guess a lot of this is like, you know, proof of concept, uh, showcasing, demonstrating before we, you know, uh, actually it comes into full practice and mainstream. But some of the documents that I've read, even in the bioeconomy, uh, you know, documents and research papers, especially those that are being published here, or very few of them in India, they still have like indicators which are kind of conventional. It still talks about, again, you know, uh, pro, you know, how much, I mean, the quantity produced, how much money earned, income. So again, you know, slightly again, not mainstreaming, although it is a nature-based kind of an industry. So 
um, those are two things. And yeah, I think those are two things I would explore and look at bioeconomy as an uh, you know, entry point. Thank you. Those are very interesting inputs. You know, the um, idea behind this has been around some time. In fact, Bali Para Foundation has been talking about nature economics for, for more than a decade. And, you know, they've been uh, looking at these kinds of issues. You have in Atri, uh, I, a lot of us, and I used to have been in that business for a long time. Uh, we do need to encourage people to keep hacking away at this because it's fundamentally important and yet it doesn't fit into normal political or, or political economic decision making. So we have no choice but to keep hammering away. I really do want to thank the organizers of the meeting. They've uh, put together ter a terrific uh, set of interventions. I'm sorry that we lost uh, Mr. Malhotra on the way, but frankly, this was a great conversation and I appreciate the two panelists uh, being so cooperative and, and, and insightful, being able to give us things that we hadn't really thought of much before. Uh, Saurav, you are going to take over the responsibility of answering the questions being raised on, uh, from the participants. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Khosla, Sarla, Shankar. Uh, I apologize on Saurav Roy's behalf. He sent me a text saying that he was caught off guard in a rainstorm just outside of Jamshedpur and wasn't able to make it. Uh, we have uh, quite a few questions. I don't think we can go through all of them but I'm going to pick some of the most relevant ones for this discussion and begin shooting them. And I will, most of those are open-ended and could be answered by anyone. So I leave that call to you, Dr. Khosla. Um, one question is, um, many times large infrastructure or development projects are cleared despite numerous evidence, including cost benefit analyses and environmental and social impact assessments that highlight that the negatives largely outweigh any positives. This is after making the business case that the project doesn't make sense from a sustainability point of view. How does one reconcile the building of a coastal road project in Mumbai or a large thermal power plant in a biodiversity hotspot? How can we use the existing empirical evidence to actually influence decision making in light of changes like dilution of existing environmental impact assessments? So, uh, it's obviously aimed at Shankar, but uh, I would, I would uh, like to have a few words after that. Shankar, would you like to start? No, Ashok, why don't you go first? I think you you're, know, you're you far, know, far more qualified than I do. Speak not first. really, but you know, I uh, did start the Office of Environment in the Government of India in 1971. And Mrs. Indira Gandhi threw three or four big projects at me. I was 31 years old. I didn't have any idea on what I could do with these. I didn't have the tools. I didn't have the staff, but there were things like a huge fertilizer plant being funded by the World Bank in uh, New Bombay. There was the Mathura refinery in Mathura near the Taj, and there, there were big, big projects. Uh, there was a, an, an amazing project that the Navy, the Indian Navy, wanted to do in Chilka Lake for uh, a naval base, which was amazing given the fact that this is one of the most precious uh, biomes uh, in, in, in the world, let alone in the country. So I, I've been through um, a very tough time learning what it is that impact assessment and, 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 and making the trade-offs and decisions in, in this field uh, imply. And all I can say is that uh, these are difficult decisions. You do have to have in a poor country like ours uh, a certain amount of economic uh, activity that is going to be hurtful and you have to make very very uh, strong decisions one way or the other but there are certain irreversible costs that you cannot you cannot uh, afford uh, to compromise the fact of the matter is that there are values particularly species particularly uh, water systems uh, there are all kinds of things that we are now paying a huge cost of for, not have, for having neglected them in the past. So all I can say is that in the case of a postal uh, road, which does not have a business uh, value, the only thing all, all one can say is that the vested interests, which are promoting 
that road uh, are very powerful and, and only a people's movement is going to be able to deal with them because they own the government. There's virtually no way that you're going to be able to deal with it. So it has to be a matter of the kind of protest that you're now seeing, for example, in the US uh, for other reasons. But the point is that uh, governments are not in a position to make rational decisions if they do not have the strength of the voters behind them. And if they don't see that, that and they have the strength of the, of, the, of the business, people who finance them, um, you're going to get an answer that's wrong. So I believe that you cannot leave this to the most well-intentioned bureaucrat who wants to do everything right for the environment when the pressures are so high uh, from above. I remember in the case of the Chirka Lake, the admiral, who was a very famous um, uh, person uh, in India, uh, never forgave me for my decision. I mean, I've gotten into a lot of trouble, but, but that was the end. I mean, you have to do what you have to do. But I would say, I would say that you cannot just hope that pure rational um, calculation, analysis of what are the benefits and costs is going to get you the right answer unless you also deal with the political economy of the issue. Now, Shankar. If I can just add to that, I completely agree with Ashok. I think it has to be a people's movement. The only thing I would add, and I'm, I'm shut my video off because I'm, I'm having bandwidth problems. Uh, the only thing I would add is I think uh, there is a case also to not just uh, address the political economy issue, but also address companies that want to actually then build these, yes. uh, these infrastructure. Uh, because I think I think that is the, that's the piece that we don't do enough of. Uh, the company in this case is a very well-known one, very uh, you know, uh, famous one. But I don't think there's any protests really about how the company is behaving or are there any ways to go to the board of directors and say, look, you're a responsible company. Is this what you want to do? Did you? So I think there are, there are lots of elements that we should start doing because this is how... Uh, movements overseas, as Ashok was saying, actually got built. Uh, I mean, if you if you go back to sweatshop labor, at the end of the day, the sweatshop labor issue got, got in a sense, addressed only because uh, students in universities started boycotting products that were made from uh, sweatshop labor. So you want to not only address the, the, uh, the political economy, absolutely must do that but also try and address companies that you think are not behaving this way. Yeah. Can I make a comment? Yes. Yeah, well, even, I mean, they have, there have been instances where there has been a lot of empirical data, because the question is also asking, can we use the empirical data available to, you know, in the question. But there are cases that we know of where there has been empirical data, lots of work, ecological work, biodiversity work, and yet it has never stopped, you know, and there are many examples in the Northeast, in other parts of the country, and also people's movement. If you look at some of the, you know, longest people's movement, like the Terry Dam and all that. So well, many times, even these things, yes, you're right. you know, it hasn't stopped them. Yeah. But I think in many cases, probably in not such huge projects, probably in some other projects, maybe we as academicians or as, you know, uh, uh, civil society have even failed in our probably our role of also saying providing some alternatives probably you know saying that okay if this doesn't work this is the way it could work yeah, of course. so of course you know the right questions and asking the right questions also are saying that you know these are some of the a b c d if you don't do this then you could do this kind of thing uh, i sometimes we have not even been able to pro probably provide those kind of uh, information Very good. Very yeah. good point. Sora, would you like another? I think we have time for one more question or one or two. Yes, yes. I, th I think I think we, we can manage two, two in. I think Sora, Roy just managed to connect in. Sora, if you're there, please say hi. And we'd be happy to have some words from you. Yeah. Is it raining a lot? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, he just, he just, yeah, he just talked about skin. So I'll, I'm just going to move off. And I think that this question is, 
quite linked to the comments that were j just made about, uh, I think, changing people's perceptions and also understanding people's perceptions. So th this is about uh, the Gross National Happiness Index and says that the, the GNH index m measures focus on perceived human ecological relations, but no objective measures of ecological health and human welfare or, or vulnerability in relation to ecological health. How do we envision an index that fixes this disconnect? Well, I, I, I would, Dr. Costa would be. You no, know, maybe Sarna, would you like to say anything on that? Um, I think uh, that's, a, I don't think I would be able to answer as, as such okay. because, you know. Uh, and, and Shankar, do you say, do you have views on GNH? I, I mean, I have a view. I, I certainly have a view on it that I think it's a good thing. But beyond that, I have a fair yeah, shock. Yeah. So, no so wisdom to offer. I've spent some time in Bhutan and at the GNH Center, and and we do a lot of work here. I, I'm not sure that what the questioner is saying is absolutely correct. It is true that you may not have an objective measure uh, of the order of how many tons of wheat you exported this month. You may not have that level of precision. But more and more, every, every month, the Bhutanese um, uh, GNH Center is getting closer and closer to measures that make good logical sense and adequate comparability with other measures so that you can decide whether this combination is better than that combination. So it's not really without a fair amount of science behind it. You know, there, there's uh, nine major categories. There's around 90 odd uh, subcategories. They've done a huge amount of work. And they're not the only ones. Brazil has this. Yes. Brazil, is, its politics is, is in a mess right now, but they've done a lot of work. Uh, there's a fair amount of work in the Scandinavian countries. There are a lot of places where they've done excellent work. But Bhutan certainly has um, given its heart and soul to this measure. And I would say that if, if a country were to adopt uh, the present state of progress on, on uh, defining GNH, it would be at least as well off, if not better off, than using pure GDP. I mean, it's, it's a very solid piece of science. It's very good science. Uh, it uses... Um, human uh, psychology a great deal, of course. It uses sociological factors. And it has a mix of parameters that satisfy a very wide variety of, of value systems. Uh, and above all, it gives a great deal of, of emphasis to uh, a balanced life, a balanced life in which you have good balance between work and, and life. Uh, but where you have uh, the ability to decide, you design uh, what your own future is. And I, I think it's, it's a tremendous piece of work. Uh, and I'm a great admirer of it. I don't believe you can put numbers, uh, one to 10, uh, on every one of those parameters, but you're getting closer and closer to it. And I would, I would say it's as good for me as GDP. Can I make a comment over there? Yeah, I also think like, you know, our own perception of indicators, it's, you know, the way we've been taught and educated and trained. So it's a lot is about numbers, exactly. or about quantitative thing. And we kind of undermine some of these, you know, qualitative uh, indicators or qualitative things and kind of say that, you know, it, you can't measure it. It doesn't have any unit or metric. So it's, you know, it's not a very good measurement. So I think we need to also rethink about the way we define indicators. Shankar's quote from Bobby Kennedy says it all. I mean, you know, it's, yes. it's very straightforward. Yes. Uh, you miss it, you're missing the point, buddy, if yes. you're going to be going with just GDP. Yes. And, and I think that, yes, of course, we should criticize anything that's not perfect needs to be improved. But this is a pretty good direction to be going in. Yeah. So do you have any more time, sir? Thank you so much. I mean, we do have many more questions and I think we will have the questions shared with the, with the moderator and the panelists. 
and I'm sure that you would be happy to answer the questions over the course of the next few days. There's a few really relevant questions and actually about 12 questions actually that must be answered. Um, I'd like to use this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Khosla, Shankar, Sarla for your time. Uh, apologies again that Saurav Roy could not make it. And Dr. Khosla, I leave the last words to you to summarize and thank you all very much on behalf of the Balipara Foundation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to say two words. One is on, in summary, I think all of you heard what we said and I, I don't want to have to repeat anything except that it was obvious that we're very deeply concerned, all panelists were very deeply concerned about the fact that ecological parameters uh, biodiversity related and nature related uh, issues are inadequately um, being fed into the decision making process. Uh, whether it's in businesses or in government or, or indeed in NGOs and, and most, most sectors of the economy. So that is, if you will pardon me, my summary. My plea, which comes out of that summary, is that in our country, and indeed almost everywhere around the world today, but we're only concerned about our country, uh, the people who are concerned with these issues are also under threat. And the people who are concerned with these issues are largely what we call civil society, uh, are largely NGOs, they're think tanks, they're media, they're academic research organizations. The civil society, which is all the sectors of the economy other than government and business are at the moment not able to function uh, in the best interest of the, of the, of the nation because um, they've been really pretty massively emasculated by a variety of means. Thank God, and, and it's very unfortunate to have to say this, that this recent crises that have come up, COVID and, and then locusts and then cyclones and super cyclones coming from all sides have woken up the government a bit and business that there is a need for civil society. We've been just recently in the last two or three months begun to be recognized as a significant and important player. So I just want to make a plea that we all have to now, the bulk of the people in this, in this uh, webinar are, are from that sector. Uh, and, and those who are not, I think, understand how important it is. But I think all of us are now owed to the country that we try to make sure that there's a balance between the different sectors. You cannot just have the two-cylinder engine driving a nation. You, you really got to bring on board uh, a very large number of other people. And I personally am involved very heavily, and so are people from um, Balipara Foundation and others, in trying to revive the, uh, the standing, the, the position of civil society to be able to do the kinds of things we're, we're doing here, which is try to keep um, a mirror to the government and business that they've got to behave well, which is to blow the whistle if they're not, which is to give them tools by which they can do better, like measure, uh, their performance, and these are not done by internally by either of those sectors. So I, I just want to make very strong plea that you go away from here not only about the issues we've been talking about, but also the ramifications institutionally for India not to, if it were to lose the strong um, civil society that it has. So that is basically what I would like to leave you with. Thank you, sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Khosla, Shankar, and Sarla. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Sarla. Thank you, Ashok. Thank A you pleasure so as always. Thank you very Thank much you for so joining. Much. Thank you, Dr. Hope Khosla. To see you all very soon. Thank you so much.